Hi, hey, everyone. Welcome to the NTC webinar. Just giving a minute here for people to filter into the room, and we'll get started in just about one to two minutes. those just joining, we are just waiting one minute for everyone to filter into the room before we get started. Just another minute or so, we'll be ready. All right, looks like we have everyone in the room, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the NTC webinar. Here we are talking about creating a single source of truth for enterprise network automation today. Uh, unifying your data sources to simplify the network and your automation journey. Little agenda for what we're covering here. We'll have the uh, current state of enterprise network automation, uh, enterprise data management and governance, and an intro to not about single source of truth and our project there, uh, some demos, and then uh, kind of look at the future as we move forward. Who we have here on the audience and the uh, panel today is uh, myself, Tim Shryak. I'm the director of sales engineering here at Network to Code. And then as our uh, panelists, we have John Anderson and Christian Adele. Just a little plug for some upcoming training we have here at uh, network to code. We have our Nodabot extensibility workshop on February 2nd and automating Nodabot with Python and Ansible on February 16th. These are virtual uh, classes done on uh, Zoom and you can also sign up online using our uh, discount code that we have here in the slide, Nodabot Web 10. And as far as the next webinar coming up, December 15th, we will be talking about firewall and security automation with Nautabot and Palo Alto Panorama. So really interesting look at how we can use Nautabot into doing automation around the firewall space. So interesting coming up on our next webinar on December 15th. And with that, we'll be moving into today's talk, current state of enterprise network automation. Off to you, John. All right. Thanks, Tim. My name is John Anderson. I'm a principal consultant here at Network to Code. Uh, excited to be back uh, on the webinar series. And uh, yeah, we'll be taking a look first here at um, what Network to Code has seen through the years as far as uh, where enterprises are uh, with their network automation efforts. And we have this kind of high level graph here that shows that um, it's, a, it's, it's a journey that most organizations are on, right? And it usually starts with, you know, a couple of engineers that have a little bit of programming experience or get into that realm uh, within their careers. They start building some automation that's interesting to them. Uh, the organization catches on to that and starts to, to scale those operations, scale the delivery uh, of that automation. And then really at that point, uh, the organization hits an inflection point, right, where they realize that they can operate the whole network this way, that there's a lot of tangible benefits in doing so. And we really get into uh, much more advanced topics like intent-based networking. And then, you know, we can, we can dive into more advanced things um, like fully automated control of the network with uh, machine learning and things like that. Um, not a lot of people are in that space, right? And that's kind of the story today of where is the industry? And how can we help the industry move forward uh, through this journey? So as far as platforms and architectures go and, and where people are, right? As I mentioned, we kind of start with these personal with these personal scripts and where we see most of, excuse me, sorry for the pop up there. Uh, where we see most of the industry, right, is kind of within the the first third to first half of this journey, right, where we are, building what amounts to power tools for uh, either individuals or teams within the networking organization. Uh, and the, the, the story that we really want to hone into today is the data that backs these automations that are being built. 
uh, and this this term called the source of truth, and specifically today the single source of truth that backs the intent data uh, that we build all of this automation uh, on top of. So from that data perspective, there's a maturity model that kind of that we see aligns to this journey. You know, obviously we start with things like inventory management, so managing the list of devices that uh, that are active within our network, and then we want to run automation against. Uh, typically, the next thing that people will get into is um, refactoring the way that they do IPM or, or their IP address space management. Uh, from an automation perspective, that could be things like uh, uh, proper allocation of space or IP addresses and things like that. Obviously, things like uh, tracking VLANs, uh, then you can get into some more advanced DSIM concepts like um, tracking, maybe for documentation purposes, power and cable management. This is this becomes really powerful from an automation pers uh, perspective for things like allocation of new resources and capacity planning and things like that. Um, then circuit management often is a is a next topic. Uh, tracking things like racks and then really configuration data. So being able to provision a full device configuration from the data that backs all of our automation tooling is, is really the, the end goal with tracking all of the, uh, the, the finite data points, right? And that's really the problem statement for today is how can we properly manage all of that data uh, within our enterprise? So, you know, again, somewhere, uh, along this journey, most enterprises are, right? So the network team has discovered some automation, realized that it's neat and, and uh, they can they can get a lot of benefits personally out of it. Uh, and then the organization kind of gets behind them, but there's some problems along the way. And a lot of that comes down to data governance and management of data and providing views of network intent to the various automation toolings that we need to build to manage the network. So, you know, what what we see a lot within Network to Code is a lot of success in building automation frameworks and specifically platforms tailored towards network automation, right? So if we can centralize in some ways the different components of the automation tooling that we've got, that can be from a data perspective, it can be from a network services uh, perspective, but, you know, things like providing centralized views of that network intent. And we'll talk today, that's our focus, right? is about how we can manage data in a distributed environment, but still provide an aggregated view of that data from which we can build our network intent, ultimately our network configurations that get deployed to the network and so forth. Um, but it's also you know, building platforms that provide automation services that are consumable at scale as well. So really it, it, it is this story about the, the source of truth from a data perspective and you know, it's 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 not just a term that people are throwing around. You know, there there is actual data to back up that this is the direction that the industry is going in. Um, you know, Gardner has some recognition here, uh, as well as um, uh, EMA Research. Uh, I won't read these to you, but the 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 story is that that people are figuring out that this is an important topic, and we need to figure out how we can create uh, uh, views of intended configuration state. Uh, from different data points and different sources uh, of, of data. And of course, when we start to do that, we immediately run into uh, the, the, the ultimate challenge, which is that the data landscape within our enterprise is often very complex, right? Um, it's very rare that in a uh, decently sized organization, that we have one tool that stores all of our network data, right? It's just, it's it's unrealistic. Um, and what I mean by that is really the management of this data. So not necessarily that there can't be one system that provides a view, that's what we're gonna talk about solutions to today, but really it's that from an organizational perspective and from a business process standpoint, it's very rare that all of the network data that we care about is managed in one tool. So, you know, things like, we may have a system for IPAM, and that system is really good at doing things like DNS and DHCP, but as a side effect of those services that it provides, it often wants to own the management of that address space, right? It makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, and we uh, propose that that can be perfectly a, a perfectly uh, amenable operating model, but it's often important that we make associations between our IPAM data and things like uh, IP address associations to device interfaces from a configuration standpoint, right? So being able to provision my layer three interfaces and their associated addresses is very important. And we don't want to create a bunch of duplicate data from a management perspective to be able to do that across the various tools that we have within our organization. So this is the, the, the problem statement of the day, right? Is how do we deal with the complex nature of the data landscape within our organization and how can we build an effective uh, source of truth for the intent of our network? And this gets us to uh, enterprise data management and governance. You know, it's, it's not just a technical problem. It is a business process problem that we have to solve here. Uh, and, and that's that's really captured here in that uh, different organizations operate at different scales, right? Uh, but at Network to Code, we we find that the needs of these various organizations are often quite universal. You know, things like uh, knowing that I need an audit trail of all of the changes to the data points that I have within um, my network intent, right? or knowing that in certain critical parts of the organization, I need uh, rigorous approval processes. Um, maybe that's uh, for my own uh, safety constraints. Maybe I have regulatory, you know, uh, statutory and regulatory compliance that I have to um, uh, uh, show and meet. Uh, things like being able to attribute ownership to data so that we can enforce accountability and proper management of that data are, are very important, right? Uh, and then often, you know, this one on the top left, I think, is is one of the more important ones that we see a lot, right, is that I recognize that the way that my organization works is distributed amongst many teams, even within my networking organization often. Uh, and I need the way that we manage our automation tooling to fit within that operational model. Now, certainly, as we go through our automation journey, we're going to be looking to make transformational uh, changes to the way that the business operates to better suit the automation that we're building and ultimately help the business. Um, but at the end of the day, this distributed nature is, is a fact of life. Uh, and so we do need to factor that into to the platforms that we're building and the solutions that we're coming up with. And really data is king in, in all of this, right? You know, at the top here, the network services are what is you know most important to what we're doing right and and i think this is this is quite apparent in the, the transition that we've seen within the industry over the last several years especially where the networks that we operate as practitioners have you know traditionally been seen solely as cost centers to the business right it's a necessary uh business expenditure in operating our it infrastructure right but more and more these days we see businesses finding tangible benefits in the network services that we provide the business um so with that in mind you know how do we build robust infrastructures in place to provide those services in a way that is resilient to the business that is meaningful to the business and those data points at the very bottom are the root of how we do that right so we have to be able to manage that data uh, in a very effective manner so that we can build the intent of the configuration and we you know the the problem statement for today is building single sources of truth we know that that intent can differ between different systems. Like in my example of um, IPAM data living in one system, but needing to be consumed in our DSIM for linking IP addresses to interfaces. You know, those are different views of configuration intent. So we need a source of truth that our automation tooling can look at to say, I know this is the correct viewpoint of a particular domain of data so that I can manage the network with that tooling in an effective way and ultimately provide the services that are meaningful to my business. So if we dive into this a little bit deeper, right? You know, when we talk about these data points, what do we actually mean? So as practitioners, if we look at this from a network configuration standpoint, you know, we can pinpoint this difference between configuration syntax and the data points that are contained within that configuration, right? You know. Um, so the name of the interface, the description of the interface, the mode of that port, or the specific VLAN ID that we're provisioning, right? These are the individual data points which are meaningful in the configuration, but are separate from the syntax. So it's, a, it's important 
Um, it's nuanced, but it's important that we make that distinction, right? Because um, often we'll get confused and this is how we can uh, easily fall into vendor lock-in as well, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, right? But it's important that we recognize that there are discrete data points that go into building a configuration, not just the line statements that we build within our CLIs. So it, it, when, when we extract that data, then we start have to answering questions of, you know, is the data correct? Why am I deploying VLAN 5 versus VLAN 6 or 7? Why is that correct in different contexts, right? So, you know, when we do this, this is how we can start to get to vendor agnostic rendering of configurations or abstracting things a bit further, right? You know, maybe I need to send a JSON or an XML payload to a a cloud controller to do provisioning and things like that. These are only possibilities when we make that distinction between syntax and individual data points. So the source of truth being the foundation of all of this, we recognize that we need to extract the data, separate it from the configuration intent, and store that in a place where we know that it's correct, where we can manage that data in, the, in a correct way and be able to render the configurations that we need at a later point in time. So this is how we decouple um, you know, CLI syntax and API calls from that data. It's how we get to vendor agnostic network automation. And we believe strongly that our network design should really drive this process. So we design our network and we figure out the syntax of the configuration, right? And then we feed in the data points that ultimately render that configuration at that point in time, excuse me. So what is the intended state, right? And this is really where we get into how do we carve up the different network data that we have? So we talked a bit about inventory, we've talked about IPAN, a little bit about DSIM, but there are other domains of information, right? And each of these domains represent often their own source of truth. And this is uh, where we make the distinction between a source of truth and a single source of truth, right? So a source of truth is an authoritative repository for an individual domain of data. So we can have a source of truth that is just our DSIM data, a source of truth that is just our circuit inventory, right? Um, but to do meaningful things with automation, often we need an aggregated view of that uh, intent. And that's where the idea of aggregating these different source of truth domains into a single viewpoint comes into play. So we have a system where we're able to uh, either extract or feed these uh, different uh, source of truth data points uh, in a way where we can aggregate it all together and provide a common uh, network data model. And we call that our single source of truth. So when we do that, we have to start answering questions of what system is authoritative for this, right? Is our aggregation layer then the authoritative source for these different things? Um, you know, which individual systems are our uh, sources of record? Um, how do we define source of truth beyond source of record and things like that, right? Uh, but ultimately, it's this question of what do I trust as my data source here? Um, but creating that aggregation layer is of the utmost importance when it comes to you know, building effective network automation platforms. So, you know, obviously, once we have that aggregation layer, we can throw in the automation engines, um, different viewpoints into that data, be it you know, REST APIs or GraphQL interfaces. Um, you know, but it's it, it's really that aggregation layer that, that we're here to talk about today. So again, it's about taking those individual source of truth um, domains and feeding them into a system where we can provide a unified view. And what we'll talk about is there's obviously many different ways that we can achieve that from an architectural standpoint. There's a few, you know, common architectures when we talk about this sort of thing. Um, if we're doing more event-driven automation, and typically we'll see that uh, at a larger scale, maybe in a different you know, service provider or uh, you know, cloud scale uh, environments where we're provisioning and deprovisioning resources uh, at, a, at a high rate, this idea of event-driven automation makes a lot of sense where we have uh, a common event bus or message queue uh, and different services that may interact with the different sources of truth that we have. 
uh, able to communicate in this way. Another common one that we find is um, uh, facade or proxy uh, service architectures where perhaps the service that we're uh, wanting to integrate with has a really obtuse interface or we don't want to actually store the data in the aggregation layer. Um, this idea of being able to proxy a connection to that data on the fly, pull it in when we're trying to render a configuration or do something interesting with those particular data points. Um, but that be the only interaction with that data. We don't store it in our aggregation layer or there's no good way to build uh, effective automation to transfer that data back and forth, right? Maybe it's um, some sort of weird database interface or, or something like that, right? Um, so the, the, the point on this slide is really just to say that there are obviously different architectures for approaching this problem in different ways, depending on our particular use cases. Our focus today in today's webinar uh, is on this idea of the single source of truth, which is that aggregation into a single viewpoint. Uh, and our solution set is built on an application for an Autobot, which is a uh, open source uh, network automation platform. Uh, but the idea is that we have a multitude of different ways of getting data in and out of that system uh, using this SSOT pattern so that we can provide that aggregated single view of our network intent across uh, devices, across different domains, right? So we'll now take a look, uh, a brief introduction into what uh, the single source of truth pattern and application on top of Nautobot is. And as I mentioned, it, it sits on top of Nautobot, which is an open source application. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, Christian will be going over some demos and you'll get to see its user interface and uh, a, a, perhaps a, a small bit beyond just what SSOT is today. Um, but what Nautobot primarily provides in this context is a unified abstract data model for network intent. So things like tracking our device inventory, we have hooks into IPAM, things like circuit management, uh, interface connections, uh, and beyond, right? There's so much more to it than that. Uh, it is extremely flexible as well. So we have the ability to define organizational specific custom fields and relationships within that data model so that we can tailor it to our specific needs beyond just what is provided in that uh, abstract uh, network data model. What the SSOT app provides on top of that, and I'll back up and say that Nautobot is an extensible application platform for network automation. So the SSOT architecture is itself a series of apps that we install on top of Nautobot within our organization to, to fit our needs. So what the SSOT app provides are the primitives for doing uh, comparisons of data between systems. So the SSOT app builds in the constructs to go and talk to the various individual sources of truth, the various systems that contain the different data domains that we care about, um, be able to connect to them, compare that data and import it intelligently within Nautobot or export that data from Nautobot to the various systems, depending on particular use cases, right? So, you know, what that architecture primarily looks like is, again, we've got Nautobot as the platform, the framework for single source of truth is installed on top of Nautobot, and then we have individual integrations, which themselves are their own SSOT apps, as we define. Uh, and these are tailored towards specific solutions. So we have uh, various integrations, just a couple of them shown on this slide. We've got a slide later that um, shows a bit broader what the, what the current ecosystem looks like. Uh, most of them being open source today. So if uh, you know, you've got particular use cases with some of these vendors or solutions, um, many of those solutions are free and open source and you can go and install them today if you are running Nautobot. Uh, but basically each of these uh, integrations has business logic contained within them that knows how do I talk to Arista Cloud Vision? How do I talk to IP Fabric? How do I talk to ServiceNow uh, and consume the data that exists within these various systems and translate it to an internal uh, abstracted model so that I can do comparisons across data points and decide uh, within the SSOT framework, what I want to do with that data. Do I need to update it? Do I need to do a full sync? Do I need to publish data out to these systems and so forth? So, you know, primarily uh, just to take it one step deeper as far as what's actually going on here, 
uh, contained within SSOT is an open source library called DiffSync. And this is really the, the magic sauce uh, behind the SSOT framework that we have within Autobot. What it does is we build adapters within DiffSync that know, again, how to talk to Cloud Vision, how to talk to Nautobot and so forth. So these adapters are responsible for making the connections out to these systems, uh, pulling data in, uh, and then DiffSync defines a common data model that exists between two systems. Uh, so this is an abstract model, basically the greatest common uh, denominator between these two systems from a data model perspective that we convert the data from two systems into. And then diff sync, like the name implies, actually does an attribute level AB diff between uh, two data sets. So we pull in the version of the data from Cloud Vision for existence and the version of the data from Nautobot, and we compare those at the attribute level. So this is beyond simple um, extract, transform, and load operations that we would find in different uh, places within our business and making intelligent attribute level decisions about, you know, if I just need to update the host name of a device in Cloud Vision based on a change within Nautobot, I can do that. Uh, or vice versa, right? If uh, Cloud Vision has provisioned a new prefix out of a container network and I want to pull that into Nautobot for documentation purposes and reporting, uh, I can do that just at that attribute level. And then there are models that, of course, the output of that diff, they know how to go and make the various um, respective updates to those particular systems. Uh, and just a screenshot of you know, what a diff looks like within the SSOT framework. And again, at the attribute level, we can see uh, what's happening here. So in this particular uh, diff uh, uh, example here, we're going to be creating a bunch of interfaces within Nautobot based on whatever system um, we did a comparison of the inventory of devices from Nautobot to. We decided, okay, well, this device, you know, um, LHR Leaf 06 already existed. It had some interfaces that existed, but it's missing some within Nautobot. So we know that from a SSOT standpoint, the source of truth for this particular device says that I'm missing interfaces. So I better go and create them in my abstracted um, aggregate uh, view of my intended network state so that it is correct when my tooling comes in to say, give me all of the inventory of interfaces for all of the devices that I care about in particular automation. I know that that is uh, correct data based on the um, actual source of truth for that particular bit of uh, domain intent. So we have different uh, sync types within the SSOT framework. Um, target and source syncs are primarily what you'll see. So target sync would be we're taking data from Nautobot and syncing it to another system. Um, when we talk about creating a single source of truth and an aggregated view of data, uh, if we're doing that within Nautobot, the source sync is, is what we'd often be talking about. And, you know, again, to state that basically we're saying that in a source sync, some other system is likely the authoritative origin for our data, either our SOR or just our SOO, the source of origin or source of record uh, that forms the source of truth for a particular portion of the network domain. And we're saying that we want to pull that into Nautobot. Maybe Nautobot isn't going to manipulate that data. Maybe in Nautobot, we provide only a read-only view to that data. But the idea is that we can make intelligent decisions within Nautobot in the context, excuse me, of the holistic data model with the intelligence of the data that comes from these various different systems. And then our automation tooling can consume that consolidated view of the network intent from Nautobot or whatever system, whatever platform that we're building this type of architecture on, right, and then go and manage our network in that way. Um, SSOT in the bottom here does support bi-directional syncs, InfoBlox, uh, our integration with InfoBlox is a good example of that, where um, IPAM is a really complicated space, um, as I'm sure um, Christian will get into a little bit here today, but, uh, you know, there are cases where we want to perhaps manage data in both an Autobot or InfoBlox, but be able to intelligently sync those changes back and forth between those systems and be able to be ensured that the data is correct at any point in time. So this slide just shows a, um, 
an, a very brief overview of um, what the landscape looks like for the various integrations that we have. And I will point out that this is not everything. Uh, it's impossible for us to get all of the integrations that do exist at this point in time here at the end of 2022, uh, things that are on here. We do have some other integrations that are worth uh, pointing out, things like um, Palo Alto Panorama. As we mentioned, we've got an upcoming webinar on that. We do have an SSOT integration uh, there as well, as uh, as well as some other integrations um, with BGP modeling. Um, there's some enhancements to uh, the ACI. You know, we mentioned that we've got a chat ops integration here. We've got some more fundamental ACI integrations uh, on the horizon as well within uh, this platform. But as you can see, we've got a broad swath of um, integrations here for different domains uh, within networking, different uh, vendor integrations or just fundamental um, uh, things as well. So with that, I'll begin to hand over to uh, Christian, who will walk us through a few demos related to SSOT. Thanks, thanks, John, for your introduction. And I'm going to actually take the ball from your introduction, because you already mentioned the different use cases that we can find in this space. And the one that we're going to focus today is, a, am going to say, a pretty common one, where you have an autobot in the middle to coordinate the data from different places. And in that case, in that scenario, we decided that the best strategy to keep the system of record, the actual ownership of the data for IPAM is in Infoblox. So Infoblox is going to keep the IPAM records. However, these records are important for us in the source of truth where we have the inventory that is an autobot, that we have all the devices, and we want to use these objects, these IP addresses, these prefixes to connect maybe with an interface. And then from the information that we already have in Autobot, we would like to take this information and use in other places. So on the right side of the slide, you have an integration with a popular change management system, ServiceNow. Why we need this integration? Because if we want to keep, in this case, all the data around aggregated in Autobot, we want to still expose to the user via the change management that they can ask for a change on an object, a device that is not defined in ServiceNow, but ServiceNow has the information because it has been populated from Nautobot. So in this scenario, we have the sync from Infoblocks to Nautobot about IP address management. And then we are going to take information from Nautobot to ServiceNow. The first thing that we have to notice in this slide is the data mappings. Why? Because every one of these systems have a complex data models. Nautobot has dozens of different models to be able to properly define all your network intent. However, we only want to focus on some of these data models. For the Infoblox to Nautobot integration, we only focus on four models, the prefix, IP address, VLAN, and VLAN group. These names are the ones in Nautobot. So here you have to start connecting the dots with the DivSync library, what John mentioned before. The challenge here that we have is to make two different models, what a network is in Infoblox, we want to map to what a prefix is in Nautobot. There are different models, but they make some sense. They have some commonalities that we are gonna put together. And this is the information that we are gonna take from one place to another. On the other side, we are going to transfer, for instance, what in Autobot is a device to an object in ServiceNow called IP switch. We are going to do this conversion. And this is happening behind the scenes, as we are going to see on the demo. So I'm going to take the, the screen, John. This one. Good. And here we have the UI for, for Nautobot. And we have a really simple scenario where basically we have one device, uh, a device that is located in Barcelona, Spain, where it's from a specific Cisco type, and this device have some interfaces. Great. All this information has been defined by ourselves as our intent to control the inventory of this object. The first step is that Nice, we have this information, but I would like to get an IP address for this interface. 
However, we agreed that the information for IPAM is not in Autobot, it's taken from Infoblox. What, I, what we can use here is the single source of truth framework that has been, has been installed here. And we already have two different options. We have an option to synchronize from Infoblox to Nautobot, another one from Nautobot to ServiceNow. In order to save some time, because we are in a limited space, I already ran this synchronous job a few minutes ago. And we can check how it went. So yeah, this was run one hour ago, more or less. It took nine minutes. And here in this screen, you can see a long diff of what happened. So what happened here was that initially Nautobot had no information about IPAM, anything at all. So we took everything that was considered relevant from our mapping, from Infoblox, and we have transferred this to Nautobot. At the end of this, almost 7,000 objects have been created. Where are these objects? So now these objects are part of uh, an Autobot ecosystem on the data source. So I can go to the IP addresses and I can see a lot of IP addresses that as you can imagine, I have not spent my day in typing them. I have been imported everything from Infoblox. What we need to do now is start using this. We want to start using this, this information that we have imported and we can do this in different flavors. The normal one is we are going to go to the device and we are going to start using this IP address. For instance, we want that this IP address that is not assigned. You can see that is already tagged that has been seen from Infoblox. I want to assign this IP address to one of my devices, the only one that I have. So I can go, I can select the, the device, can select the interface, and I can see how things start to pop up. So I'm connecting an object, a data set that I don't have, I don't own, is owned by IPAM, but I want to use here. Great, I have this information and now I'm connecting the data sources. What else? I could decide that while I have this object here, why I, not, I not, cannot change this and maybe change the description and say that the DS name from now on is gonna be ABC, just matching the same site that I already have. I can do this. Good. The question here is that we have to keep in mind what John mentioned before, the data ownership. We got the information from Infoblox, but the ownership, the system of record is still Infoblox. I can use that here. It's not a problem, but can I modify this data? What happens if I go to the job and I try to run a synchronization again? First thing that you can notice, there is a common framework that this is taken from the shared framework for C the SSOT, the single source of truth. All the different plugins take something from default, profiling, the back mode, dry run. What's dry run? Dry run is just using the diff. You are not doing the sync. So it's a really easy way. Something like Ansible has the check option that you can see what could happen before doing that. Because we want to do things actually here. We are gonna run this operation again. So we are starting a synchronization process. Remembering what J John mentioned before, what we are doing here is taking data from Infoblox, taking data from Nautobot, convert into the model that we have in common and do the diff. This operation will take around two minutes. What's the interesting thing here in Nautobot? It's how it is working. This is a completely asynchronous operation. So now I could just continue and I could inspect other things. Why? Because Nautobot provides a really strong foundation to run asynchronous tasks. In that case, we are leveraging this functionality in order to do a synchronization in the backend. We don't care about it. it's going to finish, it's going to contribute all the information, and we can keep doing other things. We can start, for instance, another synchronization that we are going to do afterwards to synchronize information from Nautobot to ServiceNow. So things can run in parallel. And also we have a really, really close control in order to decide which workers, which asynchronous tasks can take the different tasks. So we can keep that maybe we don't want to put everything synchronizing things. We can just leave one specific backend task for synchronization and another for other utilities that you may have 
in your source of truth. This is really important because it gives you the ability to leverage an Autobot not only as a source of truth, that is the main topic today, but also as an automation platform. You can keep doing other tasks like managing your network. Let's see how this is going. Let's see the logs, if it has already completed. Is it still ongoing? So if I see the, the history, the job is still ongoing. It, it's going to take a while. At the end, what we are going to see that is important is that the data that we took from Infoblox, we synced into an Autobot, we modified, we lost that data because the IP address that I changed to ABC, we are going to see that this is not correct because the system of record is still saying that is Atlanta in that case. This is going to take a while. We have to keep jobs. Last one is going to do. Okay, so you see, I'm still running this. It takes uh, some minutes. And in the meantime, something that is also interesting for you to understand is that, as I said before, we can start another job. We can start doing other things in parallel. For instance, let's start the other synchronization while this is going on. We can go to the place where we manage all the uh, jobs for synchronization, and we can start another one for service now. In this case, we can run it. We can see multiple options. For instance, the site filter. Site filter could give you which field site you want to create, but in that case, we want to get all of them. It's only one. But imagine that you could also focus all your information about the sites, the old inventory in Autobot, and replicate that into service now. We are going to trigger the job. The job is going to run in parallel. As you can see, it's doing the same process. It's loading information, in this case, from service now information from Nautobot. And now, in this case, Nautobot is going to be the system of record. So the information that we have in Nautobot is the one that we take as the driver in order to update the information in ServiceNow. In ServiceNow, we can see that there are a bunch of different devices. This is the ServiceNow inventory. And the if I look for ABC, I don't have anything. So let's see at the end of this synchronization if we can get something. In the meantime, let's see if the other job has completed. You see that the jobs are still running. It takes a, uh, it takes a while, but hopefully this is going to be done soon. We loaded all the information from Infoblox. We loaded all information from Autobot. What is the expectation from the initial job that was synchronizing information from Infoblox to Nautobot? Because we rely on the system of record being Infoblox, we expect that this is going to complain about the change that we did on the DNS name. So, a few seconds, it's almost there. Christian, while you're waiting for this, I have a question yes. for you that we can maybe discuss with John. Uh, you were just showing uh, making the mapping of uh, IP address to a device and an interface, and you did that by hand. Um, could maybe you and John talk about how we might be able to do that via automation rather than having to make that mapping by hand? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, what, what we're showing here is an integration with Infoblox that has been built on some of the primitives that exist within the model within Infoblox. And that works great for moving things like prefixes and IP addresses and things like that into, into and out of Nautobot, right? Um, what you're describing, uh, Tim, I think is a, is a wonderful example of something that might be more organizational specific. Um, so, you know, DNS names in particular, right, tend to be uh, quite specific to the way that uh, we are operating our network in our organization, right? Um, so what we can do is use this uh, SSOT in integration with Infoblox as a base, and we can build a custom integration within our organization using the Nautobot Apps framework uh, to build in that custom business logic that would do that mapping 
uh, for us automatically. Uh, and in that case, it would be rather simple, right? Because we'd be trying to map up whatever the DNS name is and info blocks to the device name within Nautilbot based on whatever our internal business logic is for the way that we name things. Uh, and we would be able to build that integration in, right? Thanks, John. Back to Thanks. Thanks, team, for the question. So this has been completed. And now at the end of this operation, what we can see on the difference, as we expected, is that the SSOT for taking information from Infoblox to Nautobot is complaining that in the source, it's still Atlanta, not ABC, the site. So this is not right. And this has been changed. This has been updated. However, this is not everything because in the device, in the if you remember, we assigned the interface, the IP address to the interface, and this information is still there. Why? Because this was not a part of the data model owned by Infoblox. Infoblox owned the DNS name of this address that, as you can see, has been updated to match what had in the source in the system of record. This is what is important to understand the ownership and what you can actually do. But it's really important for us to be able to use this information to connect this IP address object that we don't own in Autobot. It's taken from Infoblox and now we use it. If we go to the other job. Interject that, with what I think you're saying and uh, make sure that I'm hearing it correctly, which is you're saying essentially we can enrich the data in Nautobot and that will not get overwritten so long as that information is not authoritative in the other source of truth. Is it, did I hear that right? Exactly. And if you just create a relationship between an IP address to an interface, this is completely unrelated to what Infoblox understands from the IP address object. The synchronization from Nautobot to ServiceNow has created different things has created in the Cisco vendor a, a new model that we took from Nautobot. We created a new location, ABC, that actually belongs to Barcelona, that is connected to an object that was already present there, that was Spain. And we created a lot of different things like the serial number, the location, the different interfaces. The point here is that now when we go to ServiceNow and we look for this, this object, ABC, let me check it again. Let me see. Oh, sorry, I forgot to run it. I run it as a dry run. So this actually is a good demonstration that when you run something in dry run, you are not actually changing things on the object. So we know now what could have happened if I did it in the proper way and I did without the dry run enable mode. So this is an ex a showcase about what you can do if you are not actually sure what is gonna happen. Doing like this, you understand what will happen. And we don't have time now to run again. You can run on your own because everything is a open source project and you can run on your own. You have this kind of inter service, service now or Infoblox. But this is actually an interesting point to understand how easy it is to do a dry run operation to understand what could happen to your network before you actually do a synchronization. Why this is actually important? Because we have a lot of new use cases for the SSOT framework. We, have, we are considering how we can in interact this with changing an actual network controller, changing network state, all our potential things that we have in our scope in order to make this framework more capable to, to solve new use cases, adding easier customization, more performance in order to do all these kinds of things. So there are a lot of new things that are coming for the framework. And important is that everything that we add as a new feature goes to the framework itself. So it can be used for the ServiceNow integration, for the Infoblox integration, all of them benefit from these incremental innovations. So this ends my demo, John. So you can take back. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, just for the sake of time, I am actually going to hand it over to Tim, and I think we can jump straight into uh, some Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we do have one question coming in here from uh, Adam Wilkins in the chat, um, basically asking, can we, uh, if we enrich the data in Nautobot, 
can we then push that enriched data back to the external source of truth? So let's take a scenario like you were just demonstrating, Christian, where we're um, extracting some data from Infoblox. Maybe we enrich a particular field um, on that data in Nautobot. Can we then turn around and push that enriched data back into Infoblox from Nautobot? So this is a good question because technically it's possible. So in Infoblox, we have the integration, a bidirectional one. But then the problem is for you to understand who is the owner of the data. If you start doing this, and you don't have a really control of who owns that attribute, this can end up being a mess. So it's important for you to define if for IPAM address, Infoblox is your system of record, just keep it like this and not synchronize back from one to the other, because then you could get into inconsistencies. It's better to properly define. So it's more like an organizational problem to understand how you want to manage this information, because technically you can do whatever you want. Great, right. So I, th I think what I hear is basically uh, you can absolutely do this, um, but it potentially could become a mess as you are trying to maintain where am I supposed to uh, update this particular piece of information, I think is what you're what you're getting at. So it definitely is going to require a lot of controls on the business process side to make sure we're updating data in the correct place if we do this. Uh, another question, and for those uh, in the audience, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into either the Q&A or the webinar chat. We're happy to answer. Um, Another question uh, coming here from just what I was observing as you were doing the demo. Uh, one of the things you were doing is, is, is triggering that synchronization job by hand. Um, can you talk about some ways that maybe we might trigger it via some external tools or via automation, you know, in, in cases maybe where we would want to do that? Yeah, actually, this is one of the best things of all the Nautobot framework, because I can imagine at least three, four different ways that you can trigger a job. You can trigger a job via an API, so you can externally run a job. You can run a job from a, a scheduler. So you can say every day you can run a job. And lately, a new feature that has been added to Nautobot is having a job as a webhook receiver. Uh, so not the webhook, job hook receiver. So you could eventually, when something, an object changes in Nautobot, it could trigger an SSOT job that could synchronize this information out of Nautobot. So Similar to the concept of a webhook, when something changes on the database, you are going to trigger an operation externally, an API call. Now, from the last release of Nautobot, you can actually trigger one of your jobs. And an SSOT framework is nothing else than another job. It's a different type of job, but mostly the same. And for sure, I think that John will know or have another <laughs> suggestion to trigger jobs. Yeah, there's a, the, the, there are some... Um more lower level interfaces. Uh, so if you are writing custom apps, uh, you have the mechanisms within the um, SDK itself to be able to trigger jobs in that way. Um, again, not about being an extensible platform, uh, you as an organization, obviously you can install the open source apps that are available uh, or partnered with uh, network to code professional services, but you also have the ability to write your own uh, applications within your organization as well. Um, and you have all of those advanced uh, interfaces available to you for uh, defining custom jobs and executing them and, and so forth. Great, thank you. Uh, and then we did just get a question in the chat, uh, essentially asking, is there a plugin available to pull data from the CMDB and update it into Nautobot? Um, and essentially that is really what we're discussing here today is the, the single source of truth application. And that is exactly what it's designed to do is to pull from an external uh, uh, or to synchronize between an external uh, CMDB uh, or other uh, source of truth and Nautobot. So that can be a bi-directional choice. And then another uh, late question here just coming into the chat, and I'm just uh, taking a look at what that is. Uh, when some of the uh, interface data is managed externally and some of the interface data is managed internally, is there a way to make sure that the externally managed data is read-only, eliminating the need to correct any user error? So, yeah, this is obviously, you know, the question around, is there a way to... Um, uh, enforce, say, read-only on that data coming in from that external source. So, Christian, in the case where you went in and updated that IP address, um, could we prevent the user from doing that because it was synchronized from an external source? So, the short answer is that we don't have this attribute level granularity right now to protect this, but I think that we have been talking internally to add this support in order to make 
attributes that we mark as not owned by Nautobot read only. So you could only just see them, use them, but not change them. But this is something that have to be added as an extra feature. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, and to, to expand on that a little bit, so what Christian means is um, if I have my device inventory, for instance, and I want to um, you know, make only, you, you can only update the uh, host name of, of a device within an Autobot, but you can't change its, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't it's, it, its site location within an Autobot. That isn't a possibility today, but you can carve up the inventory of devices. So say if a part of my organization is responsible for my firewalls, I can have that group of people manage only the firewall devices within Autobot. And my route switch folks can manage only the route switch devices and so forth. Um, and then obviously to, to take that a bit further, right? And we talk about these different data domains in the context of single source of truth. Um, you know, obviously if I've got a system that manages my circuit inventory today and I want to pull that into Nautilbot, but that system also has, I don't know, maybe my IPAM data, for instance, just as an example, uh, and I want to be able to edit my IPAM data in Autobot, I can do that from that system. But if I want to make my circuit data read only in Autobot, I can do that, even though those two data sets are coming from the same uh, origin external system. So, so that's to say that Autobot does have a very extensible um, RBAC framework uh, at an organizational level for data management. Um, but to Christian's point, we don't have that constraint of individual attributes within a particular uh, record of data just yet. Excellent. Thank you, uh, John and Christian. Uh, with that, we will be concluding our webinar today. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, the webinar will be published online as well as the slide deck will be available uh, coming up in the near future. Thanks everyone. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thanks.